Hello, my name is Minty McCliver and I am here with my dad, Kevin McCliver, um, who invented the Multimac. Now the Multimac, as you can see from behind us, is a multiple child car seat, um, the only one of its kind. And um, we're here today to, um, well, pick your brains really, and just find out about the early stages, how it came about, um, what the hurdles were, because we know there were many hurdles and, and challenges, um, and yeah, just hear the story from day dot, really. So do you remember the time, the, the moment that you kind of had this idea in your head? Was it a certain, ah, I need to make that? Or did it take a bit of time to, to fester? Well, it's a bit of an evolution, really, because your uncle Alistair had four children before we did. And he was a poor junior doctor. Mm. And he was pondering what sort of car to buy. And uh, I suggested that he bought either a Ford Granada or an Opel Senator, which were big cars and very cheap, and had a specialist upholsterer retrim the back seat to take four children. Uh, and he ignored me and bought a Volkswagen Transporter. Why, why was he asking you? Just because he knew you knew your cars? Probably. Or and how just many, in general conversation. I suppose you'd have had three children at the time. Then, did, yeah. At the time. Yeah, you yeah. being the youngest. So then we had a fourth child and we had a couple of seven seaters anyway. So we didn't have a problem transporting you all around. But if you've got a seven seater, you've got a child in the back you can't get to mm -hmm. and you've got a lack of luggage space. So it occurred to me that any back seat that would take three adult bottoms ought to take four children's bottoms. So I made the first Multimac. Um, and was this before Clem was born? No, it was after Clementine was born. So we drove around of with, course, the, yes. with the seven seaters for a little while and hence yeah. realised the, the drawback. It wasn't backs. ideal. So you, you drew one out and then yeah. got one made? Yeah, well, oh. um, I'm a proper engineer. Um, I designed then environmental control systems mm. and energy recovery systems and we had a factory where we'd make the bits because they were all one-offs. So I drew up the Multimac and then we made one. Um, I managed to get an article about it in the Daily Telegraph, and it was actually that seat you see yeah. up there. Um, and interestingly, before that article, I, I, it occurred to me that we needed a name for it. Um, and I, I kind of thought of a few names and wrote down Multimac. And then my wife came to my office and said, I think you should call it the Multimac. So I turned over wow. my bit of paper and that was it. Wow. Um, so there we are. I then called um, British Standards because obviously you have to crash test these things. Um, so hold on, before, so you'd made it and did we all sit in it? Did, you know, did we start using no, it straight no, away? No, no, not until I'd done the first crash test. Uh-huh, of course. Um, so I called British Standards and they said, oh, we saw about this, we saw this in the Daily Telegraph, so we wonder when you're going to call us. Um, it's going to be very difficult because our test rig only accommodates single child yeah. seats, but if you come, we'll have a look. So I went to British Standards and we crashed our first seat and it was quite an adventure for them as well as me really because there's no protocol for testing child seats. Normally, child seats for a certain age range, more than 15 months, 15 months to three years, three to six, six to 12 or whatever, um, and you have dummies and you have prescribed seats and you do the crash test. So with a Multimac, you could have one child in it or four children. Mm. And the test seat itself is only 800 millimeters wide to take a regular child seat. And it's got a lap and diagonal belt that goes that way, the one that went that way. So when I put the Multimac on it, the two outer seats were kind of overhanging it all. So it's pretty unfair. And they decided that um, the worst case scenario to test it was to have a 12 year old, six year old, three year old, and a nine month old like that. So all the weight was on one side. Mm. So when we did the first crash test, it kind of slewed around. And uh, in the crash test, you have to measure how far the head moves like that. Mm. And also the chest decelerations. So if, you, if your seat is too rigid, then your chest decelerations will exceed. Yeah. But if it's too soft, then the head will move too far. So it is a bit of a balance. And obviously we have one little one at one end and a big one at the other end. And so that didn't work. We had a head displacement of about 700 millimeters. So I uh, went home, <laughs> redesigned it, went back again. And uh, we had some straps which anchored to the uh, lap and diagonal, the, the shoulder bit of the car seat. And 
in order to make that the same width as a real car, I had a bit of steel made and painted it yellow to match and put that on. And that didn't quite work either. So I then devised these energy absorbing legs, which mm -hmm. you can see. And the advantage of those is that they will bend at a predetermined rate and then continue bending. And that actually accommodated the fact that you could have one newborn in it or you could have four 12 year olds, you know, five kilograms or 150 kilograms, huge, huge difference really. And the test seat didn't have a floor. It was just a chair on rails. So I made a floor. And every time I went there, I bolted my floor on and we, the legs were on and we did the crash test. And weren't you the first person to put legs on a car seat? Yes. Because we do see Well, we assume I did because the um, test seat didn't have a floor. So, <laughs> yeah, no, yeah, so no one had done it before. It, it, it would have had a floor. Um, and then eventually, uh, the seventh attempt, it passed the test in as much as the head displacement was less than 550 on all of them. And the chest deceleration even on the little one was less than 55G. So that was great. That was on the 11th of the 11th, 1999. As you recognize, 1111 is Remembrance Day, and British standards is, of course, very um, proper and British. And we were so engrossed with this test, um, and the way the test worked in those days, it's, it's improved a lot since then, is that you have to wind the test seat back with kind of rubber bands, effectively, big, big bands, and then let it go, and it slams forward. And as it's, you're not allowed in the rig, so you're standing outside um, a sort of crash-proof door watching, while it's winding back, it's going boo, 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 boo. And as it was going back, and you can't stop this cycle, we realized it was 11 o'clock. Oh, gosh. And we'd missed it. And then, you know, at about a minute past 11, it smashed down the, uh, the, the test track and passed, which was quite a wonderful feeling. And the guys at British Standard said, uh, well, we can't give you an approval. And I said, why not? And they said, because you modified the test rig. And I said, how have I modified the test rig? And they said, you put a floor on. So I said, well, every car I've been in has had a floor. And they said, well, in this 100-page document, it doesn't mention a floor. So I said, precisely. It doesn't say you can't have one. And they said, well, we don't have the authority to give you a pass because the test rig's been modified. So I said, uh, why didn't you tell me this two years and 50,000 pounds ago? And they said, well, to be honest, we never thought you'd make it work. So we didn't think we'd be having this embarrassing conversation wow. so i said who's your boss and they said vehicle certification agency so i said what's the name I said brian parrott so i uh, called brian parrott and said uh, hello you may not have heard of me i've been working with bsi on a multiple child seat uh, i've passed the test they won't give me an approval because i've modified the test rig and there was a deadly silence for about a minute and he then said I can't believe that British standards have been working with you for two years and they haven't told me. I said, well, sorry, you know, it's not really my problem, is it? Can I send you all the information and you can tell me whether or not we can have a certificate? And he said, yes. So I sent him all the information and waited. And then two weeks later, he called me and said, look, I don't have the authority to give you, uh, you know, I'm sorry, there's nothing I can do about it. So I said, who's your boss? And they said, Department of Transport. And they gave me a name. So I called Westminster and went to see them. They gave me a pass. I went there with my car and met this uh, Euro MP guy. And uh, I explained it all to him. And he said, well, this seems like a very worthy invention. Uh, and perhaps we should change the rules, um, but I shall have to discuss it with my colleagues. Now, if I table it formally, it's like the Queen's speech, you know, we won't get round to it for years. So I'll have an informal discussion with them and uh, see if we can do something. Uh, but meanwhile, I don't really know anything about child seats. So I'd like you to see Trevor Roberts at the Transport Research Laboratory. Uh, he's Britain's expert on child seats, and I'd like him to give me an opinion. So I said, OK, fine. And he said, but by the way, have you thought of testing in Holland? They seem to pass anything there. So I called Trevor Roberts, and he said, oh, yes, come. Come and show me. So I went there again with a the seat in the car, and he came out of his office and said, I can't believe 
that they wouldn't pass you. This solves so many problems. And you've told me the crash test result. I just can't believe it. So he was well on board. He was well on board. Um, and so we went into his office and, and he said, look, why don't you see if you can get the British approval? Because you've tested to the European approval. But if you got the British approval, which should be easier, you could sell some seats and make some money while you're dealing with the Eurocrats. Mm. <clears throat> and he said, so why don't you call Beverly Barrett who is the secretary to BSI uh, committee, whichever committee it was. So I called Beverly Barrett and said, hello, my name is Kevin McCliver. You won't have heard of me, but I've been working on a multiple child seat and uh, Trevor Roberts has suggested I call you to see if you could discuss it at your next meeting. And she said, Mr. McCliver, our next meeting's 10 days time. There's no way I can get this on the agenda. I thought, I'm sorry, I didn't know that. I didn't know you existed till five minutes ago. So do you think you could have a chat with the chairman and see if that's possible? I'll speak to him. <clears throat> anyway, she subsequently called back and said, uh, I've spoken to my chairman and he says, we will discuss it. So I said, that's great. Can I come? I said, no, it's a closed meeting. You can't come. So I said, well, uh, you know, seeing a picture is worth a thousand words. I think seeing something's worth a thousand pictures. Yeah. So I'm quite happy to come and sit outside BSI House all day um, if people want to come look at it. I'll speak with my chairman. <clears throat> anyway, she called me the day before the meeting and said, my chairman has said he's going to give all the delegates 20-minute extended lunch break so they can come down and see it if you like. And where are BSI based? They're at BSI House in Chiswick. Uh -huh. So I went home and said to my wife, it's great, they're going to see us. Um, so we'll go down in two cars, one with a four-seater, one with a three-seater, and I imagined it to be a bit like a, a church fete, you know, a garden party. We'd be there without Multimax in our cars, and the delegates would come out, and the sun would be shining, and they'd be looking, and it would be wonderful. But in fact, when we went there, it was a howling gale, and BSI House is in the, by the train underground station, and there's tunnels, there's a howling gale pouring with rain, and so these delegates came down in the rain to have a look at it. And uh, some of them, the ones who work for other child seat companies, are very dismissive that on their work. And then we had a few other people there. Um, eventually, this little white haired man came along and said, Oh, hello, I'm the chairman. I said, Oh, hello, how's it? Pleased to meet you. He said, You know, these grey areas are very difficult for us. Very difficult. I don't know what, if we can do anything, but. Uh, have you thought of testing it in France? I seem to pass anything there. <laughs> uh, we'll write to you. So uh, we left, and uh, a couple of weeks later, he wrote and said, "I'm nice to meet you. Terribly sorry. You know, the rules are written. We can't do anything. End of story." So I called Trevor Roberts and said, "Trevor, do you know anybody in uh, in France or Holland? I think I'm going to do do my crash testing there." And he said, I do, but actually, we here are very impressed and we would like to work with you to test it. So can you come and meet our commercial people? So of course, I said, yes. So I went and we met their commercial people and they explained how as well as doing crash tests like BSI, they would actually crash test them in real cars to get the real result. And I'd have to buy all the cars. Oh. <laughs> so anyway, I just said, yes, yes, yes. And so he then said, right, we're going to have to speak with the Department of Transport to see if we are allowed to do the testing because we test uh, cars and trains and buses and airplanes here, but we don't have a license to do child seat testing. So I said, okay. And he called me and said, okay, we'll, uh, we can have a meeting, but you'll have to pay everybody's expenses. So I said, okay, how much is that? He said, 2,000 pounds. I said, okay, fine. So we went <clears throat> to this meeting and at this meeting, they all argued amongst themselves and uh, couldn't decide who would put their head above the parapet. Uh, eventually, they concluded that TRL could do the testing, but it had to be under the, under the supervision of BSI. So you know, I figured that's a bit of a dead loss. So, As they'd been so negative previously. Absolutely. So another chapter. Now, these rules, which we mentioned, are written, and the home of child safety is known to be Sweden. VTI and the boss man there is Thomas Turbel and he has been known as the father of child safety. 
Now, I've got a younger brother who's far more interesting than me. And he met a Swedish au pair girl when he was 20 and moved to Sweden and now has a business making Swedish clogs. And he lives on one side of a lake. And I looked on the map and VTI was on the other side of the lake. So I thought, this is meant to be. So I called and said, uh, VTI, I said, can I speak to Thomas Turbo, please? <clears throat> now, in England, you've got a receptionist and a secretary and blockage. And Turbo. So I said, oh, hello. Uh, my name is Kevin McLive. You won't have heard of me, but I've been working on a multiple charts. So he said, hang on, I have heard of you. And all the European delegates are coming to Sweden in September to discuss your seat. Wow. And so I want to see you as soon as possible and Brilliant. bring the seats with you. So that was great. <clears throat> So he wanted to fix some dates. Now, um, my birthday, I'm sure you want to know, is on the 19th of June. And I had a significant birthday coming up and my wife loves parties, whereas I dislike them a lot. And he said, um, 19th of June. So I said, absolutely fine, I'll see you then. So I called my brother and said, I'm coming to Sweden to see the guys at VTI. Could you find me a Volvo estate? because that's your archetypal family car. Mm -hmm. Can you rent one for the day? So he did, and I met him, and we put a multi-mac. I drove there on the ferry with every crash seat I had. <laughs> Seven what, in, seats. in a trailer? No, no, in my Mercedes estate. Oh, I suppose there weren't many then, were there? I, I got them all in there, and we put the, the good one uh, in a Volvo estate and drove there, and they were all very uh, impressed and said, yes, we would like to work with you. Brilliant. So that was great. Finally, some positivity and from the place that you want it. Well, absolutely. It's a huge endorsement that they were prepared to work with us. However, it's never easy. The regulation was ECE 4403 and it had just been upgraded to 4404 with a number of changes. So if you look up there, you'll see that on the shoulder straps of the harnesses, there's adjusters, so like a racing driver. So you'd put your child in the harness and then yank yeah. those tight. And under 4404, you have to have this central adjuster. So, whoops, you can tighten them all with one pull. So, we had to redesign the seat. And how many, how long had it been since you had made the first Multimac at this stage? Like how many okay, years? so the first Multimac we made was in, to, was 1996. And then the, Test at BSI was um, November 1999, and then this meeting was 19th of June, <laughs> 2001. Okay. So that sort of time. And you were still working as normal. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, my real job was funding my four kids' private education and the Multimac. So yeah, good fun. Um, so I then had to redesign the seat and had to get new harness suppliers and, and, and. So eventually, and I'd, I'd come up with some innovations on the way. So eventually I had two different types of harness, six different degrees of energy absorbing legs and some other things. So I all made all these seats and put them in boxes and sent them to um, VTI in Sweden. And then I thought I'd better go and discuss it with them. So I called the uh, project manager, project engineer who'd been assigned to it was a very nice lady called Ilva Matstoms. You may recognize the name Ilva. So I went, I went there, saw Ilva, and her boss was Tommy Petition. You may recognize the name of another headdress there, Tommy Petition. And when I went in, uh, Tommy saw me and said, what are you doing? And I said, ah, I've just discussed with Ilva, I've sent everything over, and uh, we've got to agree a great program. And he said, there might be a problem. I looked a bit serious. I said, what sort of problem? And he said, um, do you want a cup of coffee? So I said, okay. And they brought me a cup of coffee on a china cup with a saucer. And they all had these mugs that said, the Hard Croc Cafe. That's right, Hard Croc Cafe. Because in Sweden, a, a crashed up car is called a croc, isn't it? Yes, indeed. So, you know, it was a tense, tense uh, <laughs> moment, really. So I said, uh, why have I got this uh, fancy little cup and you've got those mugs? And Tommy said, ah, 
you got to crash a lot of seats before you get one of these. <laughs> anyway, we went up into into the meeting room, and he said, "Look, I'm sorry it was a bit rude when I saw you. It's a bit of a shock because I was in Germany last Friday at the crash test committee meeting, um, and we agreed that since you've been working with BSI, uh, the BSI guy, David, David, I don't remember his surname, um, would." write a report and basically set the ground lines and we would then discuss it at the next meeting which was six months later and discuss it and make suggest any changes and they should then come to the following meeting with the final draft which we would endorse well that meeting was last friday and british standards didn't show up oh. and uh, we inquired and they said uh, they've stopped testing child seats oh and we know it's true because we called them because we'd like to buy some of their equipment and it's all gone. It's all sold. So um, we're in a bit of, you know, that was a bit of a bit of a shock. And they said, well, Tommy, he's talking to you now. So you'll have to uh, you'll have to do the testing. But I don't have a budget. I don't have enough time. So I said, that's all right, Tommy. I got a budget. <laughs> we can do it. They said, you don't understand this. These rules are not for the benefit of McCliver. They're for the benefit of the world. You can't pay for it. So I said, uh, well, what can we do? He said, well, nothing. And I said, pardon? <laughs> nothing. I mean, it'll take a few years, I'm sure, before it gets on the statute books. So I said, Tommy, have you seen how much stuff I've sent? I've agreed all this with Ilva. And he said, no. So well, come and have a look. So we went, and there were these uh, big containers. We opened up all these containers. And there were about 18 different seats I'd got there to crash, and harnesses and different legs and things. And he saw all this lot, and he said, Okay, we'll do it. Um, so I said, okay. Now I'd, I'd flown there on Ryanair as usual. So as I was leaving to catch my flight, Tommy said, Kevin, stop, stop. He ran after me and he said, I think you deserve one of these. And he gave me one of these mugs. Ah. <laughs> and I still got it. And then he gave me one a few years later. Well, many years later. Yeah. So we agreed a date, and um, I went back to Sweden to start crash testing. And interestingly enough, uh, if you've got a regular child seat, you're a regular company, you would go to a crash test lab, and the seat is all set up. The test seat is all set up. You, you crash test, pay your money, and, um, and go. Uh, it's very simple. But because of the weight of the Multimac, the whole thing had to be recalibrated. And also, we had to do more, more tests. So the first test we did was actually with two six-year-olds and two three-year-olds. Mm -hmm. And they were very nervous that it might fly out or whatever. So they put tethers around all their valuable dummies before we did the crash. And we did the crash, and it was just a fantastic result. We got a head display of about 400 millimeters. You're allowed 550, and our chest decelerations were around about 30, and you're allowed 55. So they said, wow. And the um, VTI is actually on the same campus as uh, Lynch Irving University. Mm -hmm. And it has all the facilities, including a very nice restaurant. Now, I don't know if you've been to Sweden, but Sweden majors on cakes, coffee and cakes. So we passed this test. Oh, we're going to have some coffee. So we went and had some coffee and some cakes. So then we came back and did it again. And we had uh, two six-year-olds and two three-year-olds. And it passed. So we went and had more coffee and cakes. <laughs> then we came back. And we did two six-year-olds and two 12-year-olds. And it passed, more coffee and cakes. So the ultimate test for me was always going to be four 12-year-olds. Uh, but they don't have four 12-year-old dummies in Sweden. Um, so I had to go home. And they rented two in from another country. And people just don't realize, you know, you know why did the Multimac take so long to approve? Well, all, all these logistical mm. things. Um, so that happened. So I went. They got some dummies in. I came back, did the crash test, and it all worked with uh, four 12-year-olds as well. So it was pretty wonderful. And then, so did you get the approval from... No, from... no, 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 no. <laughs> it was a process. So then we had to have a rear-facing seat. Of course. And um, so I bought 12 rear-facing seats from a German company, which were approved to um, 13 kilograms. And I put a base on them so they would fit into the Multimac and went and we did a crash test. Uh, so this thing was approved to 13 kilos. We had a nine kilogram dummy and it did the crash test. The harness burst, the dummy flew out and smashed against the wall. Oh my gosh. This was a, um, 
an approved seat. Um, and I'd done it because I didn't want the hassle of making our own seat. So, it didn't work. so I had to do that. So I then uh, designed the what we now call the Minimac. And interestingly enough, I just used to call it the baby cradle. And this must have been in about 2005, probably. Mm. So 2005, how old would you have been? 13. 13. So I called it the baby cradle, and you said, why don't you call it the Minimac? And so we called it the Minimac. Um, there's an interesting story on, on, on the legislation for getting Minimac. So anyway, it was called the Minimac, and uh, I had to make a number to crash test and send them to Sweden. And as always, when you're doing these prototype things, things are late. So uh, we sent the, the chassis to Sweden, but I didn't have the covers. The people making the covers were late. So I kept that one Minimac to get all the covers to make sure they all fit. And then on, when I was meant to go, um, used to fly very easily. Used to get Ryanair from Stansted to a Stockholm Skafsta, drive to Lynn Sherping, do some crash tests, drive back to the airport and come home all in a day. Uh, can't do that anymore. It takes a day to get there. And all these little flights have stopped, the ferries stopped, whatever. So I was up at three o'clock and drove to Stansted and I had, a, I had a briefcase and a suitcase with my clothes and lots of covers in it and a Minimac. And uh, imagine half past five on a cold morning and uh, I'd wait for the bus and the bus driver was a cheerful sort of a cockney. He says, all right, mate, is that a child seat? And I said, yes. He said, wow, not seen one that nice before. <laughs> wow, that's a plus. So I then went to check in, and uh, Ryanair, you know what Ryanair are like, so I, they, they uh, measured my suitcase and did that, and then checked my briefcase was okay, and then I said, I got this child seat. And they said, go over there, fragile goods. So I went over there with fragile goods, and they took it for free, because I noticed I didn't have a baby. <laughs> so I thought I had two up. <laughs> doing so, well so far. Doing well so far. So we went to Sweden, and um, we put the Minimac in, put the dummy in, and a few other dummies as well to add a bit of weight and the way you, the crash test goes uh, it's it's much more sophisticated now digitized but in those days you do the crash test and photograph it's photographed and then to analyze how far it moves you get the um you get the film up and you have to scale it with a ruler see how far and just as a matter of interest it's very difficult when you've got four dummies and arms and legs flying to actually see more whatever um, and then the instrumentation to measure the, the various forces um, is downloaded and in a laboratory, and that's then processed. And then the guy from the laboratory comes down with the results. And it normally takes five or ten minutes. But you've got four dummies, it takes half an hour. So you've done this crash test and you can't see anything. Bam! Like that. And then you look at the films and measure it, and that's all right. And then you have to wait for half an hour for these results to come down. And um, the guy, oof, he's not there anymore. He's about two meters tall, and he'd walk down with an absolutely stony face. He just couldn't read it at all, and he'd give the results to Ilva. And because this was all quite interesting, he came down, gave the results to Ilva, and Ilva said, wow. And Tommy, I like Tommy. He's sort of, you know, a bit... Straight to the point. Straight to the point, and also he's a bit grounded. Now, you're allowed 55G as a, as a chest deceleration, and a really good seat would get 35G normally. So um, Hilda said, wow. So Tommy says, what, 30? Thinking 30 is impossible. And Hilda says, no, 27. Wow. And he said, that's, not, that's impossible. We do the test. We'll have to do the test again. So we did the test again, and it was indeed. 27G again. Wow. That was pretty fantastic, really. And so the Minimac was designed for a 15-month-old. Um, so I'm pretty cocky too. So I said, let's try it with a three-year-old. So we put a three-year-old in it as well. And uh, obviously it was a bit small and the three-year-old was kind of like this. But we did the crash test and that was about 30G. So it oh, worked wow. fine. So the Minimac is um, pretty good. Pretty solid seat. Pretty, pretty good. Hmm. So what happened after that? 
so you had the the mini mac was approved the seat was approved from well 15 months up to 12 years it was yes uh well the tests had been done and then we had to establish that the force in the tether straps wasn't greater than the strength of an adult seatbelt bolt. Uh -huh. So we had to get <clears throat> some special instrumentation in and do it before 12 year olds and measure that force, which was 1.296 tons. Unfortunately, the strength of a normal seatbelt, adult seatbelt buckle mounting bolt is has to be 1.35 tons but in fact it's double that because generally you have two buckles on one on one bolt so that was a, a pretty good pretty good result and then i think i said the crash test committee meet every six months and decide the rules and they keep making it harder and harder and harder and they they had decided that instead of just crash testing a seat because you had a lot of SUVs and a lot of coupes, then the seat should be mounted not only at standard height, but low and high. And they'd, BTI had made a modification to allow the seat to be put higher. And so they said, while I was there, um, we're going to modify the seat. And we were there at nine o'clock at night modifying this seat. And they sent out and got pizzas and things, and it was great. And I thought, God, you wouldn't get this at British Standards. Every time yeah. I went to British Standards, it was like I was a schoolboy and they were the headmaster. You know? mm. It was absolutely wonderful. Um, so the seat was raised right up, so our legs were right up. <clears throat> and the next day, um, we did a crash test and failed. And that's the first time I had a fail. And the reason it failed, the legs just buckled under them because the reason is that, um, if I can sort of simulate it all, the tether strap, generally is on the floor comes through the seat into the multi-mac and when you do a crash test it stretches and goes straight so when they raised the seat up the tether strap kind of went like that mm. and in and the forces are so enormous that that it just went straight and squashed the, the test seat and the legs buckled under themselves you know so this was a, a huge shock never failed before <laughs> um and this was part of the part of the testing. You had to prove that it would work at the different uh, Yes, yes. And this floor. was a new test that had just been introduced. Uh -huh. Those of you who've been to Sweden will know that in every town centre, there's a big square, which is actually the centre of the town. And in Linköping, there's this big splendid hotel called Elite Stora on the square. Fantastic. <clears throat> and we now stay there. Now we're successful. But when I first went to, um, to do the testing and I asked VTI to book me a hotel, they booked me their hotel on the corner. So like a student hotel called Good Morning Hotel, which had little single beds and things. Um, obviously, they realized I was a bit poor and it was very expensive to crash test chassis. And it didn't have a restaurant. So in the evening, I used to go uh, down the road to Gula Husset, Yellow House, which was a very nice restaurant where men used to take their wives and uh, girlfriends. And it was very romantic. So <clears throat> that evening, Having failed, I went to Gula Husset and I gathered candles from all the adjacent tables and I actually calculated how to redesign the seat so over, in, over dinner. In candlelight. In candlelight. Um, and then came, came back and we, we modified it, the seat, um, stiffened up the legs, stiffened up the seat. I went back to the crash testing and Tommy said, ah, I made a mistake, you know. We should have raised the tethers <laughs> as oh. well as the floor, so it wouldn't have failed. But in fact, this new seat gave even better results than, than the previous one. So overall, it was, it was all very good. And in reality, if you looked at a uh, an SUV, the tether strap does go up and across. Mm. So, so we've done that. So that was that. Um, so we'd passed everything, basically. Um, and then to get an approval, it's not just a matter of, passing the the crash tests but you have to have quality systems in place um, and various other procedures and so we had to make 50 of each different size of seat and you hadn't started selling at this point of course no 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 we had to make 50 of each different size of seat and then the swedes had to come and select five at random take them all back and they all had to be crash tested and 
you basically they had to be within a certain percentage of each other. So mm. I still don't know how I managed to afford to do to build 150 yeah. seats, but we did. And what I should also mention very tragically is that <clears throat> Ilva, who had two twin boys, and uh, we've got some photographs. The boys used to come to the test laboratory, got cancer, and actually died. And she died just before we got our approval. Oh. It was a bit tragic. So Tommy came uh, to select these five of each different size seat. And um, while he was there, I said, look, Tommy, you know, if you go to Ikea, everything's got a name of a Billy. Billy bookcase. Or a Billy whatever. Yeah. So we really need a name for our headdress because we've got the Multimac and the Minimac. So do you think Ilva's family would mind if I called it the Ilva? And he said, that sounds really nice. I'm sure they won't, but I will ask them. So I said, that's great. And then we also make this rather boring headrest. And I'm going to call that the Tommy. He said, you're not. <laughs> so we are. <laughs> so that's now called the Tommy, the Ilva. And that's why. And so they did all the um, tests. They're all for it. So we passed. I've forgotten one other thing. Um, the testing is done by VTI or BSI or whatever. But the actual approval, the certification, is given by the National Road um, Administration. So we had to get it approved by the Swedish National Road Administration. So at some point during the process, I think it was 2006, um, <clears throat> they arranged for the lady boss whose name escapes me, but her surname was like our England football manager, Jürgen Eriksson. So, so they came to this meeting and I had to come to the meeting as well. And I knew it was incredibly important because Thomas Turbo was wearing a tie. I'd never seen him wear a tie before. And we went up in this meeting room and um, pity I can't remember the lady's name. She said, Mr. Mataiva, thank you for coming. We've got to discuss your seat. I understand it's done very well in the crash tests, but we do have all this legislation, which is in what is now a 190 page um, document. And we've got to be sure that it's safe and we're not, um, <coughs> not, not doing anything which we shouldn't be doing. So um, because you're English, we will speak in English and um, we'll see how it goes. I said, fine. And so they started talking in, uh, in English. And then a difficult point came up. I said, excuse me. And they started speaking in Swedish. And then they just kept on speaking in Swedish. And uh, I was just had no idea what was going on. And uh, you, there are cartoons you can see where missionaries are sitting in a pot being, um, you know, cooked or tried by some tribe. And they haven't got a clue what's going on. And then you just hear the verdict. So at the end of it, she said, Mr. McIver, and this was about three hours. She said, Mr. McIver, I'm sorry um, we degenerated in Swedish, but it has become very complicated. Um, but we can't see any reason why we shouldn't give you an approval in the test. I thought it was great. She said, but I might think of a reason. So you'll have to wait until Friday. And if I haven't thought of a reason why not, I'll uh, let you know. Wow. So that was a bit more tenseness, but um, we got there, we got our approval, and we've been selling seats for a long time since. And what year was that that you, it was 2008, wasn't it? We got our approval, yes, at, at the end of 2008. And anyway, there was more excitement, really. Um, and that was when we had a recession. Yeah. But the, the other thing we had to do, clearly, is to get insurance, public liability insurance. <clears throat> so here we were, uh, a new company with no previous history, and a seat unique, nobody else made, which is safety in a safety critical, critical item. Yeah. So with my other business, we had a very good insurance broker and he went to Lloyd's and got us insurance. <clears throat> and there was a little caveat which said the insurance company wanted to see all our subcontractors' insurance. Assume no problem. So I asked for various subcontractors and they sent their policies apart from the company that makes the chassis, the wells, it all. And they, their insurance company said, we didn't know that you were making safety critical items. We're not prepared to cover you. Now, I don't know if you know with insurance, but you can't insure somebody else's risk. So I had 150 seats. I had people wanting to buy them. 
and I couldn't sell them until this insurance thing was sorted out. So I said to the <clears throat> to the owner guy, "Look, I've got insurance, and I'm a company, <laughs> you know, that's just sprung up from nowhere. So why don't you let my broker? No, I'll do it." Uh, and three months later, he said, "Look, could your insurance broker look at it for us?" So having been through all this trauma, really, and all this expense, and finally having seats to sell, to for go. three months we couldn't. We're making wow. all sorts of excuses. And so uh, our insurance got him cover, and it was monumentally expensive. Um, our insurance was, I think, £9,000, and his insurance went up by £16,000. And they said, you've got to pay this, because we hadn't budgeted for it. What I subsequently found was that they'd had a big insurance claim the year before, oh. which is why it was all, I didn't know this at all. So I had to suddenly find this extra uh, 16,000 pounds. And further, they said, look, you may start selling child seats and then realize it's not profitable and nobody wants them and wind it up. But there will be seats out there that people are using. So we could still be liable for insurance claims. So you have got to underwrite us to say that you will continue to pay our insurances, even if your company goes broke. Wow. Personally. So they are. It's um, not easy. How friendly. Did you ever consider giving up? Because obviously you were working, you had four young kids. This was kind of an extra hassle that you probably could have done without. So did you ever just think, oh, forget this, I'm going to cut my losses and turn your back on it? Well, a lot of people say that and they say how brave you were to continue. But in fact, the reverse is true. Because if you've spent £50,000 and you think you've got to spend another... 50, you don't want to waste the first 50, so you spend another 50. So then, you know, you spend 100, so <laughs> another 50, and it, you just can't afford not to. I actually felt, because, you know, I've, ex I, I, I've sort of described the obstructions, I actually um, analogized it, maybe a bit extravagantly, that I'm walking on a tightrope across a ravine, and people keep throwing things at me, so I've got to miss these as well as not fall <laughs> off. Um, but anyway, uh, obviously it all worked out in the end, although uh, I owed a huge amount of money to HSBC. <laughs> and what did, I mean, did people think you were mad, the people you discussed it with? I don't know. I don't know. I mean... Don't care either. No. <laughs> so there we are. Um, and so the name Multimac, I love that you and Mum both had the same idea. And it's such a perfectly fitting name, isn't it? I think so. I think so. And we registered that. So, I, again, that's quite an interesting story, I feel. Um, I called it the Multimac. And my patent attorney said, do you want to register the trade name Multimac? And I said, how much will that cost? And they said, oh, about £1,600. And I said, well, no, I can't afford that because I couldn't afford it. And <clears throat> they subsequently called me about six months later and said, there's a company called Caffins in Southampton who make uh, parts for cars. And they've just apply to register the name Multimake. And if they get that, you'll never get Multimac. So what I suggest you do is you apply for Multimac and uh, we'll then write to them and say, look, we're going to object to Multimake unless you agree not to object to Multimac. So I said, okay. And uh, I think the deadline was a Friday and my fax machine sort of bumbled into life at half past six on the Friday and said, yes, they've agreed. So that was fine. So um, I saw I had applied for the name Multimac, and that went through the process. So I don't know if you know anything about trademarks, but um, <clears throat> products are put in different divisions, and you're not allowed to have a conflicting product in your division. So that's why you can have Lotus shoes, Lotus cars, Lotus biscuits, Lotus software. You know, they don't conflict. And child seats are in motor. So we applied for Multimac. Oh, and what happens is that um, the trademarks examiner will look and see if there's any conflict. And if there is, it's out. But if there's not, the name is then published in the Trademarks Gazette for three consecutive months, like Bands of Marriage. And if nobody objects after three months, you get it. So um, the trademarks examiner said, you can't have Multimac, because the Tonka Toy Corporation in America 
have some pedal cars which are two-seaters and they're called Multimax. So my patent lady said, I'm going to see her. Um, I'll persuade her, don't you worry. Anyway, so she went to see her and came back and said, I, I was unable to convince her. Um, so you've got three options now. One is to produce um, all your sales documentation for the last 10 years. Another was something equally stupid. And then finally, we could write to the Tonka Toy Corporation. <clears throat> so I said, well, we haven't been selling, we haven't sold one, so we haven't got any sales literature. And I um, can't remember what the other one was, a bit silly. And, you know, the Tonka Toy Corporation is a huge corporation. <laughs> and I'm a little person here in England, you know. That's okay, fine, I'll think of another name. And she fixed me with a steely gaze and said, Mr. McCliver, so far, you've spent £1,600 and you've got absolutely nothing. I think it's worth the cost of a letter. So, suitably humbled, she sent a letter. <clears throat> and within a week, we had a letter back from the legal department of the Tonka Toy Corporation saying, thank you for your letter. We've had absolutely no objection to using the name Multimac and we wish you every success in your venture. And I thought, this is unbelievable. It just changed my whole <laughs> perceptive perception of human nature, yeah. really. Just so wonderful. And interestingly enough, since then, we've got a number of other trademarks, and the trademarks um, attorneys come to me and said, ah, oh, someone's applied for this name. You know, we'll, we'll object. And I said, no, we're not going to object. <laughs> it doesn't affect <laughs> us. Let them have it. And so, wish them well. So that was Multimac, we got that. So then, of course, <clears throat> when Minty had suggested Minimac, we applied for the name Minimac, and the trademarks examiner said, that's fine, and it was published in the Trademarks Gazette. And at the second publication, BMW objected. We had a letter from their, a doctor of law in their legal department <clears throat> who objected and said they own Mini and every derivative of Mini. So some lawyers got involved, and clearly we won, because we now get the Minimac. But um, it all adds to uh, the life's great tapestry, really, I suppose. So that was the beginning. What about now? Well, um, I think Multimac is almost a familiar name around the world. Uh, we've sold many thousands. Uh, interestingly, within the first three months of launching Multimac, we had one in New Zealand, one in South Africa, one in Moscow, most of the European countries, and we didn't get one in Birmingham for mm. two years. Birmingham is where we're based. Amazing. Quite amazing. Uh, the company's grown. We now have employees who don't call me dad, so I <laughs> feel we're, we're progressing, and we've got some quite interesting news for the future. Should we do another podcast? <laughs> That'll be all for today. <laughs>